good afternoon welcome to one and all who are joining us on this uh, prl colloquium series today's uh, colloquium speaker is dr adidyendu chakravarti from prl who is going to talk to us on the topic space weather from anomaly to insights it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, uh, dr chakravarti he is uh, an uh, working as an associate professor in the space and atmospheric sciences division of uh, prl uh, he did his uh, uh, after his uh, uh, in few years uh, ago in 2012 he was a visiting faculty at uh, the center for atmospheric and space sciences in the utah state university and he is a recipient of the hari om ashram prayat vikram sarabhai research award in 2015 dr chakravarti has uh, over uh, 67 international peer reviewed publications and uh, he has also uh, a, a written a book chapter uh, and uh, a number and a number of review articles he has delivered several invited uh, talks in national and international conferences and served as elected uh convener or coach convener and chair of various sessions he is presently serving as the principal investigator of the aditya solar wind particle experiment aspects on board aditya l1 mission of isro he is a member of uh, aditya l1 space weather monitoring and predict uh, prediction committee which is a national committee considered by uh, isro in, in this year 2020 he has been invited as a working group leader of pillar 2 which is uh, space weather and earth's atmosphere of this international uh, program called presto which is a sco step uh, program uh, on uh, uh, the, the full form of presto is predictability of the variable solar terrestrial coupling so uh, he is an uh, uh, active researcher in uh, various uh, uh, fields uh, in terms of uh, space weather and uh, uh, and ionospheric thermospheric magnetospheric systems and he's going to talk to us as i said on the uh, space weather from anomaly to insights so with this uh, few words i'll uh, call upon dr deepak chakravarti to give his colloquium dr chakravarti thank you Uh, thank you professor palam raju and uh, uh, even after uh, so many years at prl i still gives me goosebumps when i uh, i get an opportunity to talk to uh, the prl crowd and maybe this is uh, telecast live uh, to other audiences as well uh, but still uh, it's a, it's a it's a privilege uh, for me uh, to talk in front of our uh, people who uh, on their own uh, they are established in the fields and it's a great peers in the system they are great peers in the system so it's it's a great privilege and uh, i thank you for uh, uh, for your kind interaction and uh, with this maybe i'll uh, start my presentation today okay so i guess i am visible to everybody uh, yes you are yeah so i'm making it in, in full screen mode and yes, uh, as uh, today's title of the colloquium is space weather from anomaly to insight and um, uh, in order to i mean each of the term defined in the title has a has a significance on its own and i'll let me first before coming uh, at the end of this colloquium a few results which actually justifies the title Uh, i thought that it will be uh, it will be probably good uh, for me also and for others uh, to actually revisit certain uh, certain basic understanding in the field of space weather which will help us to appreciate what uh, what the results that i am going to talk about uh, before it, i talk about uh, space weather um, it is important to understand that what and when we call it space and the operational definition of space is kármán line and it is more of an operational definition although you can always associate a kind of physics associated with it 
it is defined as a uh, as a boundary uh, which is at 100 km and that is the boundary which is uh, between uh, separates the aeronautics with astronautics and von karman long back he calculated that a vehicle would have to travel much faster than the orbital velocity to derive sufficient aerodynamic lift from the atmosphere to support itself so the space is where uh, the normal uh, atmospheric a lift will not be sufficient and a space vehicle would have to travel faster than the orbital velocity and which can be appreciated from uh, this just a second point which can be appreciated from this particular analytical equation and uh, you can see the lift force as the density it goes up in the atmosphere from troposphere you go to stratosphere and then mesosphere and the density decreases and as the density decreases, the aerodynamic uh, control becomes more and more difficult, and the villa and the space vehicle has to move uh, has to move faster uh, in order to keep afloat. And that's why the space shuttle of NASA it it actually defines 122 kilometer as its re-entry altitude, and that roughly marks the boundary where atmospheric drag becomes noticeable. Although there are certain debates on uh, that whether it should be 100 kilometer or it should be 80 or 90 kilometer. And I suggest you to go through a very interesting paper by uh, McDowell, which was published in 2018. Uh, and uh, the title of the paper is The Age of Space Revisiting the Kerman Line. So for all practical purposes, in today's talk, when I'm talking about space weather, I'll start from 100 kilometer onwards, upwards. So to define it this way, that from 100 kilometer upwards to the sun, whatever processes happen in between come under the space weather domain. And as you see, ionosphere is only above 100 kilometer or so. And as you go up and start moving towards the sun, you, you encounter different uh, regimes of plasma medium where it is ionosphere, thermosphere is there, and then plasma sphere where magnetic field lines are closed. It co-rotates with the earth. Then you come to magnetosphere where field lines get open sometimes because of solar wind and then you come to interplanetary medium where earth's magnetic field doesn't create exert any influence and it is all solar wind magnetic field and all the way up to the sun so every process in this medium is governed by uh, the properties of each of this medium and how they couple with each other and as a result of which this coupling it it decides that how the solar disturbances eventually transmits down to the ionosphere level which is uh, around 100 kilometer it starts. So this is what space weather is. It, it constitutes of, it is constituted by electric field effects, magnetic field effect, particle, and radiation. So these are the parameters, unlike lower atmospheric space weather, where humidity, temperature, pressure, we, we actually define space weather. The kind of space weather I'm talking about here, it is defined by parameters like electric field, magnetic field, uh, particles, and radiations. And given that, uh, I'll take you to a particular direction where I'll be talking mostly on magnetic field and electric field. And uh, as uh, we progress uh, along this talk, you will see that how they are important in terms of near Earth space weather. Let us see. Space weather, so to say, is very important because in a, it can affect a variety of things uh, for satellite operation, for airline passenger safety, uh, for radio air propagation, for GPS navigation, um, for astronaut safety when the astronaut comes out of the International Space Station and does the repair work. For everything, you need to know the space weather uh, very, very, uh, very well to understand and do this, to mitigate these effects. Uh, and it is all the more important because in a technologically developed nation, space weather is as important as lower atmospheric weather. So. All the, all the more important is that we need to understand that uh, how the solar disturbances affect the upper part of the uh, atmosphere and also how it actually, um, uh, the near Earth space gets influenced or disturbed by the, the processes which, is, which are happening on the sun and in the interplanetary media. Now, because I said that from I will focus on 100 kilometer onwards, upwards. So we have I marked it marked a Euler line, and this is where uh, I will we'll try to see the impact of what is happening in the 
uh, in the interplanetary medium, how it percolates down to this particular medium that we want to investigate in this particular talk. And you see that from 100 kilometers onwards, uh, it, the, it is not fully plasma. It is it is plasma and neutral mixed up. When you call about neutral uh, neutrals, we call it a thermosphere, which is here based on temperature neutral of, of the neutral species. We we can see the temperature rises up, although the density is very less. And embedded into that particular neutral medium, there is a plasma medium, which is uh, density of which plasma particles is is orders of magnitude less than the neutral medium. Nevertheless, it influences the properties of the medium in a, in a very significant manner. And so more often than not, it is considered as a system, ionosphere, thermosphere system, than, than calling it an isolation as a thermosphere or ionosphere. So for, uh, for the physics part of it and from operational point of view also, uh, these two have to be treated in, in tandem rather than in isolation. As far as the ionosphere is concerned, there are three regions. The lowermost part is the D region, which actually goes below 100 kilometers or so. The intermediate region is called E region, and the uh, F region is the topmost layer. And it's very, very characteristic differences are there in between three regions, in these three regions. Uh, if we, because I said that this plasma is actually embedded into the neutral medium, there are collisions that are important, wind, because of pressure gradient, wind flows in this medium, and as the wind flows, uh, it the particles collide with each other. And because Earth has a magnetic field, so the particles, charged particles, they also guide it around the magnetic field lines. So there are two parameters that we talk about. One is the collision frequency, and another is the guide of frequency. Now, in D region, the wind is dominating factor and which is clearly evident from the fact that the collision frequency of charged particles i for ions and e for electrons here is much more compared to the guide of frequency so that essentially tells that the neutral medium is is dominant there it, it decides the property of the medium to a great extent you come to the f region which is 150 to 800 kilometer where the collision frequency is much less than the guide of frequency that essentially tells that now the magnet the plasma is more magnetized and the movement of the plasma or the dynamics of the plasma is greatly controlled by the magnetic field not by the neutral wind although neutral wind will make some impact but it is primarily the electromag electric field and the magnetic field which will create some create the difference if you come to the e region there lies the uh, the differential property where for ions it is collision frequency is greater than the guide of frequency, whereas for electrons, collision frequency is less than the guide of frequency. So it's a differential behavior. That essentially means if there is a wind in that medium, neutral wind in that medium, it will take ions along with it because collision frequency is dominating. And electrons will try to guide it around the magnetic field line. So there will be a charge separation between ions and electrons, and as a result of which electric field will get generated in the E layer. And this is the primary site, as far as ionosphere is concerned, globally, it is a primary site for the generation of electric field. Although in the F region, uh, although I am saying that the guide of frequency is dominant, but you, we have to keep in mind that the mobilities of ions and electrons are different, and that can give rise to electric field in a different way, which I'll be talking in the subsequent slide. So keep in mind that the E region is the primary uh, place where electric field is generated. So there are two kind of, we know that dynamo action creates electric field. So there are two kind of dynamos we talk about when we talk about the ionospheric electric field under normal circumstances. When sun is absolutely quiet, even then also these electric fields get generated. And because there is a pressure gradient, uh, there, is, uh, there is a gravitational difference or there is a temperature difference between two places on the, uh, on the ionosphere and the thermosphere, there is a tidal wind, and this tidal wind actually creates at E region heights carrying ions with it. That's what I told, and it generates voltage because of the charge separation. And this is the primary electric field, and it is operational both during day and night. And over equatorial region, the electric field which you see in the F region, that means at a higher height, is actually the electric field which is generated over low latitude, for example, over Andover and it gets transmitted through the field line on the equatorial region. So that's how it happens. 
whereas f region dynamo it's 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 not so dominant factor uh, because of the simple factor in f region electric field can generate it we can simplify it this way that the current that flows in the ionosphere because it's a plasma medium any plasma that moves that creates a current but when at the day side the current can flow very comfortably because conductivity is very high because sunlight is there whereas on the night side because current the conductivity is proportional to the density plasma density in that medium and because plasma density goes down at night it actually doesn't allow the passage of current very easy, easily so that essentially says that daytime ionospheric current cannot flow easily to night side due to because of a terminator which is coming in between sunset terminator and as a result of which there is the charge separation that can take place and that is called a frigid dynamo and this is operational for a few hours during post sunset hours so post sunset hours there is a competition between e region dynamo and a frigid dynamo and rest of the time there is only e region dynamo electric field which is present regardless of sun so because sun is playing a role in terms of creating the differential heating and generating the wind and that actually creates the electric field now a very important concept at this point has to be kept in mind that when you talk about electric field in ionosphere we mostly treat it as as this electric field it arises because ions and electrons respond differently to the plasma pressure gradient magnetic forces gravitational forces as well as to the neutral waves i gave an example of neutral waves and what happens is that whenever a current flows in the ionosphere it actually creates a charge density and you can understand it from this current divergence equation and that creates an electric field because whenever there is a charge density you can take it from poisson's equation there is an electric field and that electric field is required it makes the current divergence less so anywhere a current which is getting into the ionosphere it can get into the ionosphere from magnetosphere from top uh, it can come in but eventually the current has to be divergence less if it is not then an electric field has to come in to make it divergence less and this goes on so it's it's a feedback process which is going on and as it, this is the primary reason why electric field comes in the ionosphere in the first place there are two kinds of electric field that we mainly talk about as far as deep equatorial magnetic equator or low latitude is concerned we don't talk about when you talk about plasma and uh, magnetic field we talk about drift of plasma so with in, when in presence of magnetic field ideally the plasma should have gone gyrating along the magnetic field but because there is an electric field also is present so plasma actually drifts from magnetic field direction so we talk about two perpendicular direction which is perpendicular to the magnetic field one is the vertical electric field which gives rise to east west drift and another we call the zonal electric field which is east west electric field which gives rise to vertical drift it's a e cross v effect so it's a perpendicular thing so if it is east west electric field it gives rise a vertical drift plasma drift if it is a vertical electric field it gives rise a eastward drift and over magnetic equator remember geomagnetic field lines are actually northward and it is horizontal it is perfectly parallel to the ground so the vertical plasma drifts driven by east west electric field this is the component which is mostly affected by space weather process this is the uh, component because is the east west electric field which gets part up and there is a reason why it gets part up i'll come to that a uh, little bit a few slides later so keep this in mind that when you talk about uh, the space weather effect electric field effect on low latitude ionosphere we are talking about vertical drift or east west electric field both are one and the same thing and this particular component gets affected and vertical drift if it gets affected it actually defines the way plasma gets transported in the ionosphere for example this is the continuity equation i mean uh, the rate of change of plasma density it the production and the loss term is pi and del and vi is the transport thing so the transport of plasma it decides that how the plasma density will change in the f region and that transport of plasma can be because of the electric field so over equator something like this which is happens which is captured by this movie you can see that each of these charged particle are gyrating around the magnetic field lines and they are also drifting from the magnetic field line so this is the vertical drift which is taking place as it is going up it is seeing a pressure gradient force means it is 
hotter place, it is cooler place, so it is going there, and also a gravitational pull, so it is going to the low latitude. So although you are actually heating it up by the sunlight over equator, the plasma actually getting distributed over away from the equator in a two bands, which sort of we call it as an anomaly. So you expect more ionization over equator, deep equator, which doesn't happen, and you get it more ionization over over a plus minus 20 degree or 15 degree, you get it because of the electric field effect and magnetic field horizontal nature over magnetic. This is called an Appleton anomaly. And we showed it by different studies that yes, that, that does happen. And you can see the density is lower over deep latitude zero degree, and it get it is actually much more over a low latitude region. So this is one example where uh, when this anomaly first came, uh, it came into four, people actually understood that you expect something and there is much more intricate thing that may be happening. And so, uh, and to the bottom line is that this anomaly gave insight that how electric field is important in redistributing the plasma over an entire geographical region. So the bottom line is that ionospheric east-west electric field primarily causes this anomaly. Now, interplanetary electric field now, in the solar wind, when it flows, solar wind is a highly, highly collisionless plasma. There is hardly any collision. Mean free path in solar wind particles is almost 1 AU. So the, because the collision is extremely less, the electrical conductivity of the solar wind is very, very high. As a result of which, the magnetic field which is there in the solar wind, which is coming from the sun, is not able to leave the plasma uh, with which it actually uh, tied up in the beginning to start with. So magnetic field goes where the solar wind goes. This is called the frozen in magnetic field. OK, so B goes where the plasma goes. It follows the plasma. But if you, if you are right sitting on the solar wind right away, there is no electric field in the solar wind. There is only magnetic field. But if you are if somebody who is sitting on Earth, there is an electric field which can be uh, derived from this uh, equation, where E prime is the solar wind frame and electric field in the solar wind frame and electric field in this, it has to be zero because there is no electric field in the solar wind frame. And from there to an Earth-based observer, there is an electric field in the solar wind, which can be given by a product of velocity of the solar wind and the magnetic field of the solar wind. So you see that for an, for an Earth system, the electric field which is coming through solar wind with respect to uh, the art based observer because the moment you go to solar wind the vsw becomes zero the relative velocity between the observer and the velocity becomes zero so it doesn't exist but for ionosphere or for magnetosphere on earth and this is finite and you have an electric field now the very fact that i am a busy component is there in the electric field the moment i am a busy is southward earth's magnetic field is actually northward it actually nullifies the Earth's magnetic field, and then it gets connected with the Earth's magnetic field. So it gets connected somewhere on the top. This magnetic field gets connected. Solar wind flows like this. So there will be an electric field or potential difference between two magnetic field lines, and there will be an electric field which will come down and come down to the polar ionosphere, which will come down to the polar ionosphere. So that is why this field, which is coming in the east-west direction, and that is why the normal quiet time east-west component over low latitude is the most vulnerable. But having said that, this electric field which is coming down from the solar wind to the polar ionosphere doesn't come to lower latitude very easily. It comes under certain condition. I'll talk about uh, that. So a little bit later. But what happens is when IMA busy is southward, it actually, uh, it actually merges with the Earth's magnetic field drags the magnetic field along with it. it there is a reconnection which is taking place at the at the back of the magneto tail then the magnetic field is actually coming back towards earth and it is forming a kind of current in the equatorial plane which we call as ring current and if you have a magnetometer if you have a magnetometer and you are measuring magnetic field on the ground you will see that there is a negative uh, increase in the magnetic field horizontal magnetic field on the ground and that is actually an indicator that geomagnetic storm has happened. 
So, and why there is a negative increase? Because whenever there is a ring current is flowing, the magnetic field, because of the ring current, is actually oppositely directed to the Earth's magnetic field. So, if you are measuring from here, you will see an oppositely directed magnetic field. And as a result of which, the enhancement of ring current, because of night sight from plasma is coming towards Earth, you will see a negative increase, and that is called the ring current. So, ring current is identifies the onset of a storm the more the negative excursion the more is the storm the more stronger is the storm and then it actually recovers once the supply ima busy becomes northward so ima busy when it becomes southward it actually initiates the storm when it becomes northward it actually nullifies the storm then uh, although I am saying that IMAPZ is southward, uh, can generate the storm, but there are situations when IMAPZ can uh, northward also, reconnection can happen, but those are slightly complex scenarios where the merging can happen somewhere here, which is connected to the polar region uh, absolutely at high latitude, very close to the poles, and that drives a little bit of complex and less intense plasma movement over auroral ionosphere. But we will not talk about that. But another important thing is that when there is a Y component, Y component is actually Don Das component of magnetic field that can move the merging region. This merging is taking place here that can move the entire region magnetic field lines to either in the eastern direction or in the western direction, depending on what is the polarity of I B Y, whether it is positive I B Y or it is negative B Y, depending on that. So as a result of which the plasma, these magnetic field lines are connected to the plasma in the ionosphere. The plasma moves accordingly when B Y is is changed. So over polar region, people have seen earlier that because of the B Y effect in recent times, of course, people have seen that there are there are very distinctive movements of the plasma over the auroral ionosphere. Now. This is over polar region. There are two sets of field aligned currents. So these are magnetic field and current flows in these. And the field, the, the current which, which flows very close to the pole is called region one or R1 field aligned current. This is the current which gets connected with IMFBZ, uh, these field lines. And it actually brings down the solar wind electric field to the polar region. And there is another set of field aligned current which is called region two. This region two field aligned current gets connected with the ring current, and ring current is 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 a closed magnetic field lines. So it actually opposes the the field which is imposed here. It it is actually shielded by this region two field aligned current. So region two, what it does, it actually limits it over the polar region and doesn't allow it to come towards the equatorial region. But the catch is that region two field aligned current is a little bit sluggish its time constant is more so but region one the magnetic field in the solar wind they can change very fast so the electric field when it is imposed on the auroral ionosphere region two will take some time to develop and in that interval there is no boundary which can constrain it to polar region so that electric field can come to the equatorial region also and after some time when region 2 is developed, then it actually, auroral region, it actually constrains it. This particular process, when region 1 is greater than region 2, is called from penetration. When you see the same electric field, which is over polar region, you see it over equatorial region. And mid, throughout the mid-latitude and low-latitude, right up to equatorial region, this is called from penetration of interplanetary electric fields. Or in short, it is called PP. And the moment region two is developed, then it actually the and region one when IMFBZ becomes northward IMFBZ, then there is no electric field to shield. But region two, as it is sluggish in nature, it is still there. So this electric field will before it decays, it will survive for a certain time, and that is the time you will see this electric field, which is over equatorial AC, and this is called the overshielding electric field, and this is to some extent is known. And so these are the prompt penetration and overshielding process. I'll come back to that in, in, in the result part. Now, there is another process we call substorm. And in the substorm, what happens is storm actually extends or stretches the magnetic field lines to the night side. And because of certain changes, 
sudden changes in the solar wind configuration. It can be polarity of I wind PC, it can be ramp pressure enhancement. What can happen is the reconnection can happen very close to the earth. When I say very close, the reconnection normally can happen at 100 RE. It can happen during substorm at 30 RE, it becomes dipolar. From a tail like configuration, it can become suddenly dipolar. So you really you stretch a string and then suddenly release it. That kind of thing happens. And a lot of field lines come closer to earth at a very short interval of time. And what you get an inductive electric field. And this particular process is called substorm. And when it does, it actually injects a lot of particle into the geosynchronous orbit. And it also creates aurora. I'll come to that how it creates. Uh, basically, all the night side auroras are basically created by substorms and not uh, storms. And if you have satellite and particle detector at the, at the geosynchronous orbit, what you will see that if you are sitting right over the dispersionless injection where it is happening right there, you will see signature like this where particle fluxes will suddenly shoot up regardless of their energy. So across all the energy channels, it will uh, shoot up. And this is called dispersionless particle injection. So if you start moving away from that injection boundary, you will see that it will disperse. And then uh, you will see signatures like this, but it will not be like this. So depending on the satellite location where it is located, you can uh, actually capture the substorm signature. Uh, if it is within the injection boundary, you see something very, very uh, dispersionless absolutely ideal dispersionless particle injection, you can see it within the injection boundary. This is a, a slight cartoon which shows that what happens uh, during substorm. Um, I don't know, this movie is not working. Okay. So this shows that it's just a representative video and it shows that how the dipolarization takes place and the charged particle, it goes from the polar region to, from the, near earth magneto tail so it gets reconnected here it goes to the night side drags to the night side because the field is frozen in it drags to the night side and then suddenly you will see reconnection which otherwise would have happened somewhere here it will happen here and then the charged particle will go along the field line dump into the polar ionosphere and you will see the aurora this is typically the substorm effect uh, very very simplistically although Okay, and it creates an electric field on its own. Now, so the equit so the dynamo electric field, we it get either get added up by the prompt penetration electric field or by overshielding electric field. It is generally understood in this way that the PP electric field, which is the prompt penetration electric field, when I may busy southward, it actually enhances the local electric field, e region dynamo electric field. And the overshielding electric field, it actually reduces the ionospheric electric field. This is a general understanding. It is a gross oversimplification, although, but overall, morphologically, it works. So the role of IMA PZ is actually well accepted because these fields are created because of the electric field from an earth frame of reference when IMA PZ is southward, and then suddenly one PP electric field is created when IMA PZ is southward, and IMA PZ when after being southward for a while, it turns into northward direction, then this particular electric field is created. So role of IMA BZ is well accepted. But the roles of IMA BY, substorm, and solar wind density in the equatorial ionospheric electric field remain poorly understood till date. And it is exactly in this regard that in recent times, I'll be talking about three results that we have got, and which in a sense it creates up, opens up a three different uh, fields in some sense that there are a lot of things that need to be understood in these areas in order to build a comprehensive picture. These are these are very first results that are coming up in this particular uh, categories. So anomaly to inside the part one is the evidence for IMA BY effects on the equatorial ionosphere. So the IMA BY effects, how we showed that how it can affect. Now, before we understand that, we must know that the ionospheric electric field is irrotational, what it essentially means, or conservative, that if you take the ionospheric electric field over deep equator and you sort of take a dot product along the deep equator and sum it up, it should turn out to be zero. That essentially means that the day side electric field and the night side electric field should be of opposite polarity so that when you add it up, it actually cancels out. So there is no net electric field. 
the electric field necessity in the ionosphere comes because of imbalance in the charge densities in the distribution of the charge densities that creates electric field and when electric field gets created it actually makes sure that there is no imbalance in the charge densities and eventually it becomes curl free so this is called a curl free condition which gets satisfied in the ionosphere reasonably well now this has been shown earlier uh, that if you take hikamarka which is in the peruvian sector and thumba which is in the indian sector why these two station because when india is over the night side or in the day side exactly the antipodal points is over peru in the south american sector if india is in the day sector hikamarka will be at night sector and if india is night sector hikamarka will be at the day sector now what uh, mike kelly showed in 2007 that if you take the thumba drift which is a proxy for electric field and put a negative sign there because it has to be opposite in day and night as i said then if it is curl free it should match very well okay and that's precisely what happens that hikamarka incoherent scatter radar measured drift which is the gray line and the black line is the thumba drift and they actually match very very well if you just put a negative sign in front of the indian observation because polarity is at opposite and put it there so that essentially means that the day and night side fields are canceling each other but we got some very interesting observation uh, during uh, a particular uh, period what we saw is this is the hikamarka electric field at the e region height and this is the hikamarka electric field uh, drift basically and this is the current both of them are function of electric field the east west electric field and this is the thumba uh, drift which is also the electric field that essentially means electric field over the equatorial region over the indian sector now these two are antipodal points that essentially means that thumba you can see from the time that it is at the as a night time and this is at the day time as you can see from this time so it is morning 9 10 o'clock and here it is 8 9 o'clock in the night and during this interval which is marked by red you can see that it is positive over hikamarka also it is positive over thumba also and which is sort of counterintuitive it cannot happen because based on existing understanding this is very difficult to happen because it defies the curl free condition of electric field in the ionosphere we wanted to eliminate that there is no substorm at this place so we sort of saw the los alamos geosynchronous satellite observation and these are not uh, dispersionless particle signature or these are different magnetos pause crossing and other signatures we sort of know what this signature mean and these are not associated with any substorm so substorm was ruled out based on this then a very interesting revelation came so what we did is we took four station or more than i am showing here four stations over Indian sector, this is Indian state sector, we took four stations in this longitude sector and four stations in this South American longitude sector and compared this station with the, that station, the magnetic field measurements. Similarly, this station with that station, this station with that station and that way. So now the first one, when you, when you compare, so that if you go to higher latitude, that means here, you see the magnetic fields are anti-correlated this is still anti-correlated, these two stations over two different longitude sector. You start coming towards the magnetic equator, you see they become correlated. This is, this, is an, this is a very interesting observation. And I think this has not been reported so far earlier before this. And so what it essentially means that something is happening, which is making this magnetic field behavior, which is opposite. That means the electric field probably is opposite as closer to the poles and it is becoming similar as you are coming towards the equator under what condition it can happen so we thought that because these are region one as i said region one field align current and region two field align current this is the electric field within the polar region and this electric field because magnetic field is perpendicular e cross b that they, it flows two cell currents so ionospheric plasma it actually drives this e cross b effect this is called that's why hall current it goes this way and because electric field here between region one and region two current is in this way it actually takes it to this direction and then closes the loop so this is a plasma convection pattern here also it goes this way and here electric field is this way between region one and region two 
this closes it that way. So it's a two cell convection pattern. Whenever there is a disturbance, geomagnetic disturbance from solar wind, the electric field is coming into the polar ionosphere. This is a this is called DP2 cell. So disturbance polar two cell pattern. And what happens is if region two is uh, is not there, then this particular cell will extend up to equator. So that I as I said earlier, during prompt penetration, region two is actually not developed very quickly, whereas region one can develop very quickly. So this electric field and the associated current that can reach up to equator by the time it gets generated. So it will take some time. So it comes towards the equator. So what we proposed is that this is the two cell uh, pattern and this is the electrodynamic divider. The cell pattern is the, the speciality of the cell pattern is that on the red side, it is the electric field, the potential is positive, and in this side, the potential is negative. Okay. Now, under the effect of IMA BY and IMA BZ, what happens is IMA BY actually rotates these cells in such a way. See, Hikamarka is something here, South American sector, let us say something here on the day side, and Thumba is something here. So, under normal circumstances, they too are on two different cells. That essentially means that the polarity of electric field that they will experience will be different. If Tumba experiences positive polarity of electric field, or then it will experience a negative polarity of electric field. But what happens because of IMA BY is IMA BZ actually increases or decreases the size of these cells, and IMA BY actually rotates it. So what happens is I, on this night that I may be why rotated this cell in such a way with that the electrodynamical divider between these two cells, they covered both the stations, both Hikamarka and the Trivandrum, it actually came under the same cell. And that is only possible if there is a rotation of the cell under the effect of I may be why. So this was the mechanism that we proposed and we took support from high latitude observation where there is a series of radars that are available over high latitude which we call super done is a high frequency radar and there you can see the observations are by red arrows it is it is there and based on these arrows there are there are potential maps which are calculated by models they are actually superimposed on that and you can actually this is hikamarka station this is thumba station and the divider, I have put a red line there between these two cells. And as you can see, uh, when IMA BY became positive, then IMA PZ is less, is less than zero means it is southward. That means that is the time the solar wind effects are coming. And on top of that, IMA BY greater than zero is rotating it clockwise. So it actually, the divider has tilted in the clockwise direction, putting both the stations in the in the same cell. Now, this is a high latitude uh, modeling uh, measurement as well as the synthetic maps of potential. And that actually supports the theory that we proposed that under IMA BY effect, uh, this can happen and they can put both the antipodal points under the same cell, generating the similar kind of polarity. So, this is a very, 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 uh, very interesting observation. And probably it opens up a particular area where I think we need to look at IMA BY effects more closely than, than we ever did so far over the equatorial atmosphere. So what is the takeaway message from here is that the IMA BY can change the polarity of electric field perturbations expected at a particular local time. And if this, you don't account it, you actually, uh, the observed plasma distribution as well as the spatiotemporal distribution of plasma turbulence can spring surprises. And this is a missing element and uh, comprehensive understanding only can lead to robust forecasting as far as the space weather effects on ionosphere, global ionosphere are concerned. The second part of the story is that evidence for substorm overpowering storm effects. Now, storm is actually is the demon. Now, it, it, it has the maximum effect. So that is what the present understanding is. Substorm is, is, is always the, its effect are uh, is substantial, but it is less than strong. But we will show two cases where it is not so. For example, 
in one case you see this is the interplanetary electric field which is positive means IMFBZ is southward and when it is southward which is 5 millivolt per meter you see the electric field which you get over equator it is around 45 millivolt uh, 45 meter per second that is this is extremely large drift that means it is extremely high electric field under normal circumstances the electric field that is the quite time average you get that is shown in by the red line so it's almost two and a half times of that now if you calculate by the transmission of the solar wind electric field how much it can come with the existing literature if it take 10 percent is the highest value so far available even if you put a 10 percent transmission here still it is only a, a certain fraction that can be accounted by the storm effect so we saw that there is a substorm at that place at that point of time and the global mag not only at the geosynchronous orbit that signature was there but also over the global magnetic field of measurement this signature was there so our interpretation was that you see in the side by region when there is no substorm this electric field has created an effect like this which is sort of dripped wise it is around 25 meter per second but the same amount electric field almost has created a 45 or 50 meter per second drift okay so this is added by the substorm effect in another case so it has not only uh, compound the problem it also can reduce the effect of storm so in this case if you see uh, here the same amount 5 millivolt per meter electric field it actually reduces the magnet the equatorial effect the electric field by significant amount if you look at the similar amount of almost similar amount of electric field it creates an increase and that's what is expected but there is a substorm at this point of time by you can make out from the geosynchronous signature particle flux signature and also from global magnetic field signature and you see an entirely opposite effect you see the quite time average is this and this is the one sigma variation and it can go even below than that okay where you expect an increase it is actually decreased and substantial decrease so what we saw is we quantified the electric field effect and which is probably done uh, for the first time that the quiet time electric field is expected of this much the storm contribution is came around 0.37 millivolt per meter and the substorm contribution it can be anywhere between 0.3 to 0.7 millivolt per meter which is significantly higher and and in another case when it is reduced the the quiet time field is of this order the maximum storm contribution is 0.5 millivolt per meter and the substorm contribution varied from during that interval that 0.46 to 0.8 millivolt per meter which is which is enormously enormous reduction so the takeaway message was from there was that substorm induced electric field perturbation can on occasions be more than the storm time electric field perturbation uh, so it is it in a sense is saying that the that the mosquito can be more than the elephants okay so since both is eastward and westward electric field perturbations are possible substorms can enhance as well as reduce the storm time electric field perturbations and note that substorm is actually a night side phenomenon okay and so the observation i showed is a day side process increase in the electric field or decrease in the electric field so this work suggests that the global magnetosphere ionosphere current circuit develop differently in the day sector during substorms and this aspect is is poorly understood till date so this requires attention and my last result today will be the effect of solar wind density alone that it can create an electric field perturbation no other disturbances are there only solar wind density changes are there so what happens is we know that solar wind dynamic pressure is depends on density as well as in with the velocity and dynamic pressure is nothing but the momentum transfer by the solar wind to the uh, is a momentum flux density so the kind of momentum it transfers to the to the earth's magnetic field lines and it is given by this relation where rho is the density mass density and v is the velocity of the solar wind so if you take a differentiation of that you get something like this so three kind of possibilities exist one is that these two terms can be equal so you note that in one of the term it is delta rho that means 
variation in density and another term is the delta v that means variation in velocity now condition one is that these two terms can be of equivalent footing condition two is another possibility is that this term is less than this term so effectively giving this condition and condition three is when this term is more than the this term now condition one and condition two is is very frequently met during many of the uh, solar wind dynamic pressure changes but condition three is rare so this is what has happened on that day if you look at here this is the solar wind velocity there is hardly any change during this interval but there is a change of 12 particle per cc so from 10 it goes to 22 12 particle per cc and so there is a change in dynamic pressure and there is a pressure change in ring current there is a pressure in auroral uh, current there there is a change in there is no change in either of the uh, interplanetary magnetic field component so not only that ima bz is actually steadily northward so there is no geo effective disturbances that you are supposed to expect at this point of time there is no substorm which is clear from auroral uh, electrojet data there is no storm which is clear from the rate curve where it is shown that the time is is not good but what we and also there is no substorm because there is no dispersionless particle signature that we noticed what we saw that because of the pressure there is the undulation so this is not a substorm signature this is a well established pressure signature on the geosynchronous particle flux variations so there is no storm there is no substorm However, what you saw is that in the high latitude, the super done radar system, which is a multiple radar, which is probing the auroral ionosphere. You see, during this event, there is a change in the, in the plasma convection and it, it is actually becomes red. So it, it is a substantial velocity, uh, drift velocity of the, of the plasma over high latitude. And there is an anti-clockwise ionospheric flow vortex that gets maximized during this time when the density event takes place. It is not there before the density event and it is just after the density event the velocity has subsided down so that means there is an electric field effect which has come to polar region having said that the next logical step would have been that to see that whether it has come from polar region to equatorial region and there is a very very standard methodology for that you take all the magnetic field data and find out the edge comp the northward magnetic field component the changes in that and start from the polar region come to equatorial region and it should show that the change is maximum over the polar region this is the standard methodology and when you come to equatorial till low latitude it should decrease and over equatorial region because conductivity increases over equatorial region it should show an increase this is the standard profile of delta x that you expect and we, what is interestingly, when we try to plot delta x for this event, we exactly saw a similar kind of curve. That means there is a solar wind electric field which is coming under northward IMA PZ condition because of small changes in density. There is no substorm from polar region to equatorial region. Now, equatorial region, when you came, we saw that not only the E region current but also F region height, that means the changes in height is actually electric field. So this density changes have created an electric field effect both over E region and F region over India. And it, we have seen for other uh, longitude sectors. So what it means is that E region and F region over equatorial region, they are magnetically separated. I mean, they are not connected with each other. So so that essentially means that disturbance is coming from top. So that is a clear proof that simultaneously you are seeing in two parameters, one related to the E region, another related to the F region, that essentially shows that this is a space weather related disturbance, which is coming because of the density. So the, the takeaway message from this particular study is, that an enhancement in solar wind number density from 10 per cc to 22 per cc under northward interplanetary magnetic field condition has created a global electric field perturbation which is sort of extremely rare extremely rare and probably people don't look at it critically to see these effects and this result shows that we need to be we need to uh, look at these events very carefully 
to see uh, to actually eliminate those cases and the way this mechanism works is not fully understood there is some mhd simulation which suggests that it is exactly working the same way the way two set of field aligned current works for prompt penetration but there is a lot of unclear reasoning uh, is there and this is a field which is also uh, open at the present point of time so having said that i lend my talk with this uh, i sometimes back i was reading an article in scientific american and there is an article i saw that the power of anomalies where it is written that progress in science is sometimes propelled by the discovery of experimental oddities oddities that inspire a fresh perspective on nature and uh, i'll read it out for you that is sometimes triggered by surprises and i found it very apt for these three results that the data collection resembles gathering of new pieces in a jigsaw puzzle and placing them to together sometimes one of the pieces doesn't quite fit it is natural for scientists to instinctively argue that such a piece doesn't belong perhaps it is an artifact driven by uncertainties uh, in the data or a misinterpretation of the experiment which is not true in the present three cases which we have uh, conclusively shown this might indeed be the case in most instances instances instance says but every now and then an anomaly of this type signals a real discrepancy from expectations either a violation of a highly respected but incomplete law of nature namely an exception to the rule or an unexpected surprise signaling the possibility of a new physics so with this i will end my talk and i acknowledge all these uh, people and institutions who actually my students postdocs and my collaborators from these institutions who have helped me greatly in 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 sort of fitting all the jigsaw puzzles together and uh, solve the riddle uh, it was it has been a wonderful time thank you so much thank you so much for your time and attention thank you uh, deepu for this wonderful talk wherein uh, you uh, put several you know you covered actually a lot lot of ground you know there were there are several complex uh, each and every you know minute of yours was actually uh, uh, referring to a large and complex issue and uh, you tried to uh, you know put uh, various things together to to answer some of these uh, interesting pertinent uh, questions and I, i really commend you on that uh, and we uh, i'm sure there will be some uh, there are some questions and i am seeing one uh, from uh, uh, guru baran uh, he's asking can one of the two cells uh, shrink with respect to the others in the presence uh, of by field besides the rotation of the divider Dividing yes I, i think uh, hi guru i mean it's it's is great to have a question from you and you are absolutely right it is not only ima by uh, it also depends on uh, ima bz uh, so the relative ratio is important actually the size of the cell is defined by ima bz whereas the rotation is defined by ima by so so it has to work in tandem so that essentially means that sometimes the cell will take a orange shape and sometimes the cell will take the shape of banana and that is precisely how the literature defines it so one is uh, orange shape and another is banana shape and that shape will depend to a great extent on the relative value of ima bz and the rotation part of will depend on ima by and so i you are right that uh, it is also important that uh, the one of the cells can shrink uh, making the other cell bigger so that it it gets into uh, the no man's land where it should not enter it enters and generating uh, the similar kind of electric field polarity yes that's right one of the other uh, question i think is somewhat related gaurav uh, mitra is asking wherein uh, he's uh, um he's is um, saying what is uh, what is the again the rotated rotation of the electrodynamical divide only what is the role of bx component uh, and yeah yeah that? yeah yeah so the to answer your first question god of that uh, what is maybe the possible reason behind vi component causing rotation of the electrodynamical divider i'll put it this way that ima bz is actually connect uh, the 
solar wind magnetic field ima bz gets connected with the earth's magnetic field because they two are oppositely directed so they get connected once they get connected uh, so two hands are connected now ima py comes into picture it actually pushes it in a in a orthogonal direction in a in a perpendicular direction so it is connected in the north south plane but it is pushed towards the east west plane so that's how the ima by will come into picture so ima bz will connect it in the north south direction and then ima by will shift it towards that way so when it is shifted the magnetic field lines its footprints are in the ionosphere okay so when the ionosphere footprints are moving then the plasma which is stuck with the field lines they are also moving and that is the way the whole effect is transmitted from the interplanetary medium to the auroral ionosphere and eventually to equatorial ionosphere under under specific conditions this to the second part of your question is it's actually some people have shown the ima bx effect and like ima by effect this is also a very very uh, unexplored area uh, which we tend to take up in near future and this is an area which for high latitude some work is done to my to the best of my knowledge nobody has shown it for the uh, for the equatorial ionosphere so uh, if anybody shows it i think they will show it for the first time but yes for high latitude people have seen some cases yes yes there is a uh, question from professor vijay sahu uh, <clears throat> he is uh, saying he is a he's saying his naive question but he's putting in very interesting aspect do you not i uh, not think the quantum mechanics you know can explain some of these anomalies also the relativistic effect um i don't know honestly but uh, the 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 available explanations which are available uh, people have tried and so far i have also tried is purely classical electrodynamics and plasma physics and in the classical domain we have not got into the uh, onto the onto the quantum mechanical domain at all uh i i i don't think i am an expert enough to to address your question uh, that if there is any quantum mechanical effect but considering my naive answer will be that considering the movement that we are talking about in this case for example the drift velocities and the other thing it is not relativistic it is far away from the relativistic movement so i guess this effect will be nominal in our case and it can be neglected with with uh, with without any much harm to the underlying physics involved because the velocities we are talking about is extremely uh, sort, of, sort of so relativistic effect probably yes it can it it can be safely neglected at least to interpret these events uh, but i really don't know that for some of the other events for example uh, if you Uh, try to interpret the field aligned current and other thing whether there is a scope for that that uh, probably i am not expert enough to at tell that okay in fact you can comment on the the relativistic uh, you know accelerations that the particles uh, experience well while while the reconnection happens in night side yes okay okay raj thank you thank you and i think because i was discussing ionosphere so i didn't uh, bring that aspect but in magnetosphere to answer vijay's question and thanks raju for pointing this out i forgot it actually so uh, in the radiation belt in the radiation belt the energies can go up to uh, relativistic the, the mega electron poles so its relativistic processes are on and they is few years back dan baker and the and his group they published a sort of very important papers in nature where uh, they found out uh, uh, the radiation belt that and it's it's a long standing debate that what are the processes that actually makes them relativistic so these energies are extremely high and that essentially means there is a particle accelerator sitting in the magnetosphere and so that's the kind of analogy these people brought in although the processes are uh, understood but i think still in totality these processes are not understood in detail but yes the relativistic effects have to be taken into account when you address those processes in the magnetosphere but because i talked about ionosphere i actually didn't bring that part into the picture for magnetosphere yes definitely yes for yeah. radiation yeah. physics yeah. so there is a um, uh a question by gauro uh, on the frozen in uh, field uh, and uh, it goes where the plasma goes you know, that's what is talking alpha and waves so i have this uh, confusion how vsw and bsw 
directions are different, you know, which eventually produce ESW. Uh, okay, okay. You see, uh, I can, I could have shown you a movie which will clear all doubt, but because it is not there in the presentation, I cannot show you. But what happens is when the magnetic field comes from a particular region on the sun, you see, solar wind is coming radially outward. Whereas magnetic field from a particular region when it is coming, it is actually following the solar wind with which it was tied up in the to start with. So now as the solar wind is traversing more distances in the interplanetary medium, magnetic because sun is rotating, the magnetic field that came out, it is going away and away from the, the plasma parcel that initially uh, was tied up with the magnetic field. So what magnetic field will try, it will try to catch up with that particular parcel. And in that process, because sun is rotating, it will bend. Now, the, to answer your question, so that is the reason why there is a uh, there is an angle which will come up between the VSW and uh, and the BSW. Okay, so magnetic field is that's why Parker spiral kind is is coming into picture. Now, in the Earth's case, what is happening is because solar wind magnetic field is getting connected with the Earth's magnetic field, and remember. It is a frozen in plasma that essentially means magnetic field goes where the velocity goes. Now, solar wind velocity is moving the way it moves. So the magnetic field actually is taken to the night side because the solar wind is going towards the night side. So it is taken back to the night side. And that is why two ends of the magnetosphere are then at a different potential because magnetic field will, although they are equipotential almost because conductivity along the field line is very, very high. But two magnetic field line, there can be a potential differences at the two ends. So that is the voltage drop that is created between the two ends of the magnetosphere. That drives the plasma convection towards the night side. So this is what, uh, very crudely, that is what is happening. Yes. Uh, there is uh, one call-in question from Dr. S.P. Gupta, uh, who, is, uh, who is asking, you know, you to uh, comment on what is the coupling effect in the E and F region neutral winds during storms. Probably you didn't touch on the neutral aspects, but probably that's what he was asking. Yeah, I, I mean you're right. I didn't touch upon the neutral wind aspect, neutral aspect. But one of the there are two effects that I can think of immediately. One is that uh, when the polar region they get heated up because a lot of energy is being dumped from solar wind to the polar region. Uh, the ionosphere anyway is a resistive medium. So any current that is flowing over the polar region, it will dissipate heat. And this we call it as auroral heating. And that will create a pressure difference gradient in the ionosphere. So it will generate wind in the thermosphere itself. So heat will get transferred. So neutral molecules will get heated up. And then it will see a temperature gradient towards the, uh, towards the equatorial and polar region. And so it will come towards the equatorial region. Now, as it comes to, towards the equatorial region, it so happens that the, the dynamo action gets re, uh, sort of takes place once again, but with a disturbance wind, not with the quiet time wind. And the, it so happens the electric field that gets created by this is of opposite polarity than the, uh, than the normal quiet time. So this is called a disturbance dynamo. So that is the way one uh, process can happen. And here, neutral wind plays a very important role. That is point number one. Point number two is that because the auroral heating takes place, the thermosphere actually bulges up. So it gets heated up and it expands. And as it expands, the lighter molecules in the polar region that comes up first, so oxygen comes up first, and then nitrogen, it comes up later. Now, O by N2 ratio is something which is very, very important for uh, ionosphere because oxygen at F region creates plasma and nitrogen, it actually quenches the plasma formation. So in, if O by N2 increases, it actually increases the plasma over the uh, other latitude. And if O by N2 decreases, it actually decreases the plasma concentration over other latitude. So once, once this happens, O by N2, so initially oxygen increases, so you call it a positive ionospheric storm because those excess O by N2 ratio, excess oxygen when it comes to other latitude, they get more and more ionized and they, that create more and more uh, plasma. So it's called a positive ionospheric storm. And the reverse happen after some time because after certain heating, then N2 comes up. 
and then o by n2 comes and quenches it so you get a negative ionospheric storm although it is it is it, it i have told it in a very very first order way in a sense there are other complications in this but to answer your question these are the two processes where uh, neutral can play a very important role thermosphere can play a very important role in the uh, in the global space weather disturbances yeah i have a um, you know a question of my own deco in your second example you showed the decrease in the equatorial field during substorms you know both the examples were uh, during the daytime what is the you know reason for decrease on one one occasion and uh, uh, an increase you can increase is expected or understandable easy compared uh, to the it is, it's a very good question honestly uh, if you ask me i don't know uh, my first answer is uh, to direct answer is i don't know i in literature people talk about uh, two or three processes uh, it, it's 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 a, it's it's a lot of studies have to be done in this to actually conclusively say something and uh, because substorm current circuit that gets formed in the magnetosphere on the night side from magnetosphere it come to auroral region and gets close to auroral ionosphere goes back to the magnetosphere is called substorm current wedge so it's a circuit which gets formed on the night side magnetosphere The, but people do see its effect on the day side so its effect comes in the so the circuit any circuit has to be completed so uh, somewhere in the day side substorm effects it comes that essentially means that the circuit gets connected somewhere on the day side electrojet and other uh, current system and when it the current changes in order to make it divergence less the electric field also comes this is a this is the basic formalism on which it has to be addressed but exactly what happens nobody knows so i as far as i am concerned literature uh, doesn't uh, tell us we require probably a global observation to uh, to very critical observation most of the time what happens is that in order to see the self consistency in the circuit ionosphere magnetosphere circuit you require observation globally very very at the correct time at the correct place and getting it uh, to a number of stations at the correct time at the correct place becomes very difficult so we tried it once we didn't succeed and uh, so this is the present status so nobody is sure really okay we have a question from meghna soni she is asking a million dollar question i'm just wondering you know how tough it is to forecast it in terms of space weather events and uh, <laughs> if you are a qualitator and i would say that uh, after aditya mission and disha mission we will be in a position to talk about a little bit more uh, with some more confidence but as of now um, yes uh, is very difficult i mean we are we are starting see space age started satellite observation started from 70s onwards and there are a lot of grounds to cover and if you talk about india uh, or any other uh, this thing there are uh, i think everybody goes with a scientific mission which is sort of dedicated to a certain theme and it is very difficult with a given mission to address all the unresolved problems simultaneously so that is where the problem comes so it has to be a sustained effort over a period of time each mission with a certain geared up scientific objectives and then we have to sit up uh, and uh, join the jigsaw puzzles uh, and the missing pieces together Uh, so that process has started but uh, i don't know maybe we have to wait a little bit more to sort of because we are talking about very complex system plasma properties wise they are very different so solar wind is a one kind of plasma medium magnetosphere is one kind of plasma medium ionosphere is one kind of plasma medium on to make things complex ionosphere also cause uh, contains neutrons and it has also an atmospheric effect which is coming from below which uh, uh, which is also a very interesting topic so so this is this has coupling from all the sides and so there is a push and pull happening at every uh, corner and in order to quantify and make a forecasting model physics based forecasting model operational forecasting is a different thing in order to make a physics based forecasting model it, i think still we have some distance to cover uh, okay i would like to now uh, share with you one of the comments uh, by one of our senior uh, persons uh, you know of prl alumni uh, dr mr sivaraman 
he says, you know, excellent talk, Dr. Chakrabarti. I feel proud that the younger generation in PRL are better than we were in 1965-75. Uh, I could see uh, that in the work done and presented, uh, keep it up. So it's a very nice, uh, you know, uh, comment from him. Uh, would you like I, I, I would like to comment to one thing that we are standing on the on the shoulders of giants. I mean, uh, PRL is PRL today because of the good work that has been done, sir, earlier. So uh, we just we want to take it forward, and we want to make sure that our next generation will also have uh, some more challenging things to do. So thank you very much for the wonderful things that you people have done. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, wonderful talk, uh, Deepu. Uh, it, uh, you covered, as I said earlier, also covered a lot of aspects. And uh, and then he went into intricacies also where, you know, because uh, intricate you know, under, under, under understanding is required at, uh, uh, to really convey the results. Uh, and I thank, uh, you know, on behalf of all the PRL uh, colleagues and people who are joining us on the webinar, I'd like to thank you on, on all on the other behalf. Uh, I would um, also like to take this opportunity to announce that the uh, next week uh, colloquium, we have another um, you know, young uh, scientist who joined us uh, at PRL uh, recently, Dr. Satyajit uh, Seth. Uh, he's going to uh, talk on precision at uh, LHC. So I would uh, encourage you all and invite all of you to please uh, you know continue to uh, be with us in all wednesdays wherein we'll be talking on varied aspects of uh, sciences that are being pursued in prl and uh, please uh, you know um, uh, uh, subscribe to our uh, uh, channel and be a part of the uh, system thank you very much for joining and uh, see you uh, next uh, wednesday thank you thank you